So we have Dr. Alka Patel. Hello, how are you? Hey Callum, nice to be here. Yeah, I'm great. I've got the sun shining through my window, so feeling pretty energised right now. Yeah, I mean, we've got a little bit of sun. Uh, it's certainly not warm, but I, uh, I, are you based in London? Yeah, I am. I am in London. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so I'm a bit more north. When I say a bit more, like near Manchester north. So okay. it's a uh, slight couple of degrees towards the colder end, I would uh, I would imagine. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, no, it's it's nice here. It's got that freshness for that crisp autumnal day. I'm very excited to to have have you on as a guest because uh, of your background. So just explain to the listeners a little bit about about yourself. I am a doctor, as you know. I'm also a speaker, a coach, and a podcaster, just like you um, as well. And um, what I really like to focus on is very simply amplifying health as a skill and as an asset. Um, And really that's so that individuals and businesses can really start to think about how to create compassionate lifestyle changes for healthy, happy living and connected workplace wellness. So I really love to sort of focus on what's happening with individuals, but also thinking about the workplace as well and for me I find sort of that one of my greatest passions really is to is to empower and to equip people to actually take some time to discover and notice and activate who they are what they want and where they're going that's really where my passions really lie and you are the founder of the lifestyle first so Tell us a bit about what that is. Do you know what, Callum? I've been a um, GP, a doctor, for two decades now. Wow. And um, the reason I called my brand Lifestyle First is because I genuinely believe that for health and happiness, your lifestyle holds the key to health. It genuinely does. And it's not your doctor it's not the pills, it's not the surgery, it really is your day-to-day actions, um, and particularly the sort of that branding. Um, Because what I started noticing a couple of years ago now was that sort of revolving door of healthcare, where people would come and see me, my patients would come and see me, and they'd create this dependence on me for my advice, for my drugs, for my prescription pad more than anything else. And it's a real sort of revolving door because they'd come back and come back and come back with no real change in their health, no real change in their sort of long-term gains that I desperately wanted for them. Um, And so it's been sort of a a year, maybe two, coming up to two now, where I just decided one day to leave that sort of very safe comfort of my GP partnership at the time. And I didn't really have a, a plan B, but what I did was the day after I left my partnership, I got onto a plane. Uh, And I got on all alone without my family, um, which I'd never done before, not really traveled on my own. Uh, But I went off to a part of India, again, where I'd never been before. I went to Kerala, where I didn't speak the language. And I did some voluntary work um, out there um, for people at the end of their life in sort of palliative care. And do you know what, Callum? my bubble really burst. I just got so grounded because what I saw was kindness and compassion in communities. I saw people using their own tools and their own resources to really look after their health and care for people around them. And that's in the midst of poverty. And I saw happy people. So when I came back to to the UK, I knew something had to be different. And that's when I discovered lifestyle medicine. And that's why I created my blueprint for happy, healthy living, which is the lifestyle first method, really focused on what I know to be those 10 key important dimensions of health, because actually over 80% of our health is determined by our daily choices and our daily self-care, the stuff that's in our hands to do. Sounds amazing. And you have an acronym for lifestyle first as well. Yeah, I do. I kind of, uh, you'll find out I'm a sort of real acronym addict, love assimilation and and acronyms. So um, I've created the lifestyle first method, as I said. So each letter of lifestyle stands for what, as I said, I truly believe is the root of health. So L is life's purpose, knowing your why, knowing that purpose, that sense of direction in your life. 
I is identity. Who are you? Who's this person that wants to show up every day? F is food. And we often hear the slogan, food is medicine. E is exercise. We're getting too comfortable being comfortable, aren't we? So this is about movement. S is sleep. And uh, unfortunately, we sacrifice it too much, but it plays such an important part in our health. So that's L-I-F-E-S. And then T is time out. How do we relax? What do we do to take time out for ourselves? Why is your connections? Again, connectivity is so important to yourself, to others, social connection. Um, L is learning habits, which is one of my favorite sort of parts of this, uh, this focus on lifestyle because habits and our, our reactions and responses to life are really, really important bedrock for change. And then E is emotions, which play such an important part in our in our day to day, don't they? And first, of course, is developing. First of all, before you make any change in your life, you need to think about your commitment, develop that confidence, motivation and that mindset. So those are the first things to do. So that's the lifestyle first method. And a couple of things stood out to me straight away there, because these are the very things that I teach to, you know, in my own service, which is. So many people think it's just literally about dieting and there's so much to, to health and fitness, um, especially like when you mentioned sleep, sleep is so important. Um, and, and the thing that really stood out is when you said we are too comfortable being comfortable. Mm -hmm. And ironically, the, the greatest, one of the, the best quotes I've heard from um, like a fitness professional that I follow and it stuck with me for the last four years which is get comfortable with being uncomfortable and that applies in everything not just you know it applies in business that applies in in health in relationships it's like get comfortable with things being uncomfortable and I think people confuse comfortability as being a positive thing and in actual fact sometimes it means you're not moving forward and and, and often you know often that means you're going backwards and then you, you, you're getting worse so I think I think that's amazing, and I love the fact that you you went somewhere to somewhere slightly different to you know what we see what we perceive is the, the, the norm, and obviously you've gone to somewhere that yeah that is closer to poverty than we are, and and yet they're, they're happy and they're not using all these different medicines and stuff, and sometimes you know that's really interesting to know that something like that has completely sort you know changed your 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 mindset I suppose yeah no it is it was incredibly grounding and I think the key thing here is that actually we have so much more choice and control than we think that we have and this is back to your sort of getting comfortable with being uncomfortable is that if we just if we just stretch ourselves that little bit create that sense of growth you know that growth mindset and really get curious about ourselves which is I use this other acronym DNA which is discover notice and activate because if you can really discover yourself and notice how you show up in the world you can really activate the actions that make a really big difference um, but I think you've got to come at it with actually wanting to grow wanting to change you know what's evolution all about <laughs> that's yeah. about change and transformation so let's embrace it and actually start to enjoy it and even those uncomfortable emotions you know we spend so much time trying to get rid of them and squash them and not want to feel angry or sad or guilty but actually we're meant to sort of experience all of the emotions that life sends us and that discomfort is again part of our growth as well isn't it absolutely and i mean we won't well, you know let's get the elephant out of the room i mean with this sort of stuff what's you know what is your advice for people during this current time period you know the pandemic um because obviously everything you've just mentioned is what people need to do anyway but in consideration with this unusual time, obviously a lot of a lot of things are heightened. So does a lot of what you've just mentioned still apply or is there some some other things that we should be doing right now in terms of, uh, you know, our health right now during uh, a pandemic? I think lifestyle applies even more now because I think what what COVID has done is open people's minds and eyes to the concept of everything being interconnected so if you look at the stats that are coming through we know that people who suffer worse with with COVID-19 are those that have got 
additional illnesses, diabetes, high blood pressure, um, and also being overweight. Those are three things that have come up. Now, these are three things that actually we don't have to have in our lives. You can say no to diabetes, high blood pressure and being overweight because these are very much lifestyle illnesses. And I think what people are realizing is that actually you can change your parameters by changing the things that you do every day. And I think that's, you know, if there is a silver lining to come out of, of COVID, I think that is it. I'm seeing a lot more people who feel like they want to do things for themselves. But actually the most important thing to remember is that this isn't just changing lives or doing some stuff. It actually makes a difference. There's such a lot of research and information now that things work. These, you know, changing things makes a difference. Choosing every mouthful that you eat makes a difference to your long-term health goals. Um, and actually, you know, things like your DNA, your genetics, they're not fixed. Actually, there's a whole realm of another area I love to talk about, which is epigenetics, which is actually how the way we live our lifestyles changes the tags on our genes, on our DNA, lights up the stuff that actually makes us healthier and lives longer. And, you know, even at a microscopic level, this stuff is working for us. So um, I think, you know, in a way, I think COVID has raised the profile the lifestyle becoming even more important as part of what you do. Yeah, that's amazing. So, you know, I, I agree. I, I see so many people now um, walking, out running, going for walks. And it seems that for some people, they've only just discovered exercise. Obviously, during the first lockdown, um, everyone wanted to go out and exercise because, you know, they. I think mainly it, was, it started off for people is just to get out. But I think what happened was when I opened up my gym again after the first lockdown at the end of July, the amount of people, the amount of new fresh people that are coming, to, you know, rushing to the gym because of something they tried during lockdown in terms of looking after their health. And like you said before, you know, making every every mouthful of what they're eating counts, you know, every little thing counts. And not just exercise, sleep, rest, you know, everything like that meditation so when people came back my gym you know had this amazing growth of people and all it was all these new faces and you can tell it was people that have suddenly found this passion for exercise so i think yeah i think you're right i think covid has brought a lot of this stuff that's already there mm -hmm. but people are more aware of it now and and, and they've you know they're discovering themselves now and and, and how important um having this lifestyle is do you not think it's something about the ripple effect you know when you do one thing that feels good it ripples into wanting to do another thing that feels good and another thing so the simple act of moving more or exercising more you're also going to feel so good from that that you're going to think well do you know what i don't need to mess that up by making wrong food choices that don't work for me i'm going to eat better as well and do you know what actually i'm also going to hydrate better and i know now that in order for me to feel good about exercising tomorrow morning i feel better when i've had a good night's sleep so i'm going to do that as well and so before you know it what started off as just i'm going to get get a daily walk in suddenly starts to ripple into all these aspects of your life and actually that's the transformative bit is that self-realization that everything is connected i agree and i think the, the ripple does start from moving I it can work in other ways but what I find so with with my programs I tend to take people through that journey mm -hmm. and I obviously we, we, we're going to talk about habits but my 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 program and my most popular program um the work I've has is only in 30 days now myself and you both know that that's not enough time to really embed habits but what it does do is do what you just said it gets people on that on that ripple effect it starts people on that journey and we start off with steps and then in the second week we, we still keep with the steps but then we start adding in the, the nutrition side eating more protein making better choices uh, then we move into hydration like as you say so we drink you know one one and a half liters of water and then it starts working its way up and then on week four we really start focusing on physical challenges start get, you know working on resistance exercise and and, and I tend to see that pattern. I tend to see that as people go on, that they, they want that next step. They start, you know, going, oh. I but do you think that if people try too much of that stuff too 
too soon, that's when people tend to, to either give up or, or start to struggle. Yeah, I mean, look, at we've got New Year's coming up. I mean, look at New Year's resolutions, you know, they're destined to fail because what happens is we go all in. We're like all in or nothing. And that's the way that, you know, our minds work. We're either going to change everything or we're going to do nothing. And actually, you know, coming on to talk about habits, the beauty of exactly what you've described is that layering and actually um, enjoying those steps. You know, you've got a journey that you want to travel. You've got maybe you've got a destination or a goal. It's not about getting there. You, you need to enjoy the, the direction that you're going in as you're taking all those steps. And if you layer it, then you can really kind of celebrate all of that and enjoy it. But that's the problem. You know, we want to run the marathon before we've even bought a pair of good trainers. Um, and that's why I think uh, I think things kind of people lose hope or lose motivation um, is because we go at it too hard, too quick. Yeah. And do you think that that's because people, especially this, you know, especially with the media is what it is. And, and, and people can sometimes act on desperation a little bit. So they just want to they just want to change what's like what's immediately the problem so let's say for example people need to lose weight you know they're going off scale weight or, or what you know they're looking at a number on a machine which i'm not a massive fan of anyway but then most people will go off a number on a machine and and then for them it's like oh no i need to change that number they're forgetting about all the processes that are involved in that and that becomes an obsession that all they want to do is just lose weight and they want to lose weight now and they'll do they'll look for any shortcut to make that happen as quick as possible so they can get that that relief that they're after but actually it's it's all the the steps that to to get to to achieve weight loss or to achieve general fitness that they're the enjoyable bits like like say going walking getting you know getting in touch with nature and some of the the long-term online clients i've got and i've got one of them who is going to be on this show um in a few weeks when she first started it for her it was the same as everyone they just want to change the immediate problem but then she's now been working with me for about 14 months and actually if i ask her the questions now she's not particularly bothered about her weight anymore because she's enjoyed all these new things that she's you know she's got into that you know exercise meditation reading getting out of the house starting up new hobbies new sports so do you do you, yeah do you think that people should just sort of slow down and just try and understand what you just said that it, it's not a sprint mm. and if, if people just took their time and, and did it in baby steps they would enjoy the process so much more in the long run yeah I think probably two things from what you've said then I think there's something about this desire for instant gratification and we want that and we crave that and you know this is how digital tech works we get that you know instant gratification from seeing all those likes and comments and we we want that all all the time and that's how our reward systems work but there's also that level of long-term fulfillment and long-term contentment so I think we need a bit of both we're actually wired up to need a bit of both so we need to see some results that then allow us to enjoy the process of that longer term fulfillment. And then the second thing is about outcomes and we're driven by outcomes. So when the goal becomes, I want to lose weight, that's all you can see. But actually what we need to do is tune more inwards rather than outwards and think about, well, actually why? You know, if you can come back to your values and your why, why do you wanna lose weight? You know, let's get to the crunch of that. And then you're actually going to be driven more, not by the weight itself, but actually you, the person. Um, and I think that's the difference is trying to change again that mindset and that shift to not just being outcome focused, but actually being able to enjoy the process because it tunes in with the person that you are. Absolutely. And I think that's, you know, people will people will laugh because I, I sort of I go at diet programs a lot, um, but it's mainly because they're so focused on getting that result and as you say people want the results and they do need them results people need to see something otherwise they'll just think what's the point and they'll give up but th the problem is with these diet programs is they, they they'll help people achieve you know results quickly but there's no real process to enjoy there 
um, other than restricting stuff. You know, you, it's just a, they're just programs where you take stuff away. You're not introducing new things that to, to get excited about. So that by the time they do get the results, let's say someone's lost a stone in five to six weeks on a diet program, but all you've done is take stuff away. Mm. You haven't, you know, you haven't introduced yourself to anything new. So that you know, at the end of the the, the result of the six weeks, you go, yeah, I've lost a stone, but what have I really done to achieve that? So then I think what you said before, the long-term gratification isn't there because there was it's just a literal short-term. But then I think on the flip side, if I was running a six-week program for someone and it wasn't getting results within the first few weeks, obviously they're then going to miss that short-term gratification. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I think, I think both are really, really important. Yeah, definitely. Definitely need to think about both. And again, it's all about how we're wired, you know, what our dopamine circuits are, what our happy hormones are, are telling us, uh, how our uh, neurosystems wired to, to give us that, isn't it? And that's what it comes down to. Well, you're talking about the dopamine thing and you mentioned about technology. What do you think like social media is doing to people in terms of, of that aspect? Uh, there's a lot of chatter about this at the moment, isn't there, um, actually? Um, but I think it's, again, tech is our tool, and it's not it's the tool we should use rather than the tool that uses us. And it's back to choice. You know, we all have a choice. We just have to be able to exercise that choice. Um, so it's interesting you brought this up because it, it is a distraction tool, ultimately. That's what it does. You know, and I found certainly for myself, I'm in the flow of doing something, um, writing, you know, an article and then the phone pings and my finger goes to it. And there I'm off, you know, 20 minutes off on a tangent when actually what I wanted to do was really finish this article. And so it does take you off course, but it's, you know, it's designed to do that because it's trying to be the tool that uses you, not the other way around. Um, and actually talking about habits, then what I actually did, what I've been doing for the last few weeks is actually making my phone disappear. So it is now in a drawer away from my visual line so that I don't even see it because the yeah. people that need me are here. You know, my family need me. They know how to reach me. And beyond that, actually, that sense of instantaneousness nobody needs me that instantaneously and if they do they'll be able to reach me but by putting the phone away from my line of vision actually what I've done is created my kind of flow state and been able to be super productive I can't tell you the difference it has made in allowing me to get on with the things that I want to do that I've chosen that helping me be the person that I want to be and it sounds like a simple thing and you know what then you know what Callum I always have a break every 15 minutes to an hour we know that's you know the time uh, the way to sort of work to increase your productivity and I will check my phone but I've chosen to do that I want to make sure that I'm up to speed with whatever I need to be in the hour and then back it goes away and I've started rolling my day like this and it is incredibly powerful so I think it's changing your relationship with tech whether it's emails or your you know Instagram comments or your Facebook posts or whatever else what's that message or whatever else it is change your relationship because you get to choose how you turn notifications on and off. You get to choose what flashes up on your screen. You get to choose whether you scroll through your phone last thing at night before you get into bed and create havoc in your sleep, which is actually the most natural thing that you can do, but we turn it into something that's unnatural because we interfere with it. We choose. And, you know, I think it's really important to enjoy that choice um, and be really mindful and aware of, of your choices and making those consciously to let you be the person that you want to want to be doesn't mean you don't look at your phone. I don't think that, you know this whole notion of digital detox etc which again is banded around so much as though you know we need to detox from something because it's going to really harm us well you know what if you need a different relationship with your tech you, you choose it doesn't have to be the same for me or you or anybody else but I think you've got to know what it's doing for you and vice versa being self-employed I, and obviously all ho- all holidays have been cancelled for obvious reasons um so I, I worked out i hadn't had annual leave for two years i didn't even realize it and it got to a point where when this second lockdown came and I had to close my gym and of course i still work from home because i still work online but my wife my wife basically sat me down and went right you said during the second lockdown you got ex- you got almost excited about the concept of you might be able to get a bit of time off and already within the first week of being in lockdown, I've been on my laptop from 
you know, mm. something like nine in the morning till something daft in, in the evening. And I don't really even know what I was doing. I was, I was doing something. I was being productive, but I was probably just finding stuff to do for the sake of it. So I decided this week, actually, um, to yeah have annual leave. So I spoke to like business partner. I, I spoke to my clients. So I, I have a, a team that sort of works for me online on my online stuff. I sort of told them that they would be handling things. Everyone was fine with it. And the first day, the reason why I bring this up is the first day, I actually chose to delete Facebook and Messenger off my phone. I kept Instagram so I could promote these podcasts, but I turned my Facebook off so I can't just go on and, you know, do that whole scrolling thing that, that you tend to do. And what was so ironic is within about half hour, I sat down and I can feel myself sort of twitching. Mm. I can feel myself going to pick up my phone. The first thing I did, Alka, is I... I, I looked, I scrolled across my phone mm -hmm. to type, to, to push the Facebook app to <laughs> load it up. And I'm like, <laughs> what am I doing? I don't even want it. I'm, I'm, I don't even need it. But I found myself, I found that subconsciously I, I was doing that. So yeah, I, I, I like your, your idea of, I, I've tried having it off for a week and I'll be honest, the first couple of days were a struggle, but right now I'm okay. I've started to pick up a book. I've started to spend more time with my with my family, you know, and actually be there, not just sat there, actually engaged in a conversation. Uh, and I find I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, I'm going for runs in the morning. I'm thinking about my health more. So, yeah, do, do you think that, well, your idea before is, is pretty good, uh, is, yeah, putting your phone away um, in, in it, well, I don't know, somewhere, somewhere out of sight, uh, but, yeah, do you find that you do kind of crave it a little bit if, you, if you've yeah. hidden your phone? And it's like with any habit, with any change, you know, initially it, there's willpower until something becomes automatic, until it becomes really automatic to, you know, when I sit down on my, at my desk, I will put my phone in my drawer. You've got to make that such an automatic habit that you don't have to exert any willpower. But until then, there is, of course, going to be that sense of, I, want, I don't think I need to be doing something different here. This is the time that I would be, you know, we've got to unlearn all the things that we've learned uh, in relation to that habit, which we've created about being responsive to our phone. Because the reason we do that is the three R's of habit change, isn't it? Is because we've sort of created this trigger. So there's a reminder, uh, which is something pinging up on your phone. Then you've got the routine of responding to it. And then you get a reward because when you do respond to it, hey, you know, someone's given you a like or sent you a message or, you know, there's something that's made you feel good. And so we keep on doing that. Um, and but I don't think we need to turn tech into the demon. You know, the phone isn't the demon. So you say, you know, I, I put it away for a week. That's great. But so long as you know why you're doing that. Yeah. Like, why have I done that? It's not because I never want to engage with my phone again. It's one of my tools. I use it for my business. I use it to communicate with my, with my family. But actually, I'm putting it away for a week because, and there's got to be a strong enough why for when you choose how to use your digital device yeah. I think that's the important thing isn't it absolutely I mean I, I know the reason why why I had to do it because for, for me it, I'd still be working um because I, I, I love my I love my job so much that I, I become my job but um I think I think what it has taught me is um uh, my my business partner who owns a gym with me he actually has developed this this new routine of he turns his phone off every Sunday Mm. um because and he said something similar to what you said before if anyone needs him they can go and knock on his door yeah <laughs> if, if anyone you know and the people that really need him there and then are there anyway so it yeah. you know and I, I think it's i think it's a great idea um so do you you also have another acronym which <laughs> i love but this one's about habits and and the, the main subject I want to talk about on this episode is habits because they're so important for health and fitness in general and particularly with mental health as well, which is obviously a big thing at the moment uh, with what's going on in the world. So talk us through this. You have, what, 10 steps, 10 habits, right? Yeah, it's basically um, the acronym is Habits Work because they do and they can work for you to, 
help you do exactly what you want to do. So it's not very, not so much about what are 10 healthy habits, it's actually whatever habit it is that you want to create for yourself, whatever routines you want to create for yourself, here's 10 really, really important things to think about so that the habits work. Um, so shall I kick off and maybe just start with? Uh, Let's go with it. Okay. Let's go Let's, with them. Let's do it. So H is for hook. Um, and we've alluded to this a little bit. So you need to have a hook for your habit because every habit does depend on a reminder and a reward. So we often just sort of change our behaviors, don't we? So we often say, oh, yes, I'm going to uh, I'm going to do some relaxation and breathing exercises every day which is great, but that's an action, that's a behavior, that's not a habit that you're creating. To turn that action into a habit, you need to give it a hook. And a really useful sentence to say to yourself, to change a behavior into a habit, is to say, when I, dot, 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 I will. So there's a difference between, I will do some relaxation by breathing deeply every day, and when I sit down and turn on my computer every morning, I will sit down and take six deep breaths because you've created this hook. You've created, whenever my hand goes to turn my computer on, that's my reminder to take six deep breaths. And that's, that works because a habit always has a trigger, a hook, and any association you make with that allows that to become much more automatic. So that's my H for habits work. I like that. I like the hook. Then we've got accountability, which is really important. So it's the sorts of things perhaps that you and I do is we are accountability partners, aren't we, for our patients, our clients. So actually telling your friends and family that you're changing things is a really good way for getting all that support and that motivation for the things that you want to do. And having a coach, you know, it's a really, really good way for a regular check-in because you want to be able to stay on track. And self-accountability is really important because you motivate yourself. But, you know, things waver. And when you've got people around you that can also support you, that can also check in with you every now and again, that can also have a conversation about, hey, how's it going? You are going to be, you know, going for a 10-minute walk every day. What did you do when it was raining? Um, it's a really good way to keep yourself um, accountable. So um, I think that's the, that's the A for habits work, is to have some accountability find an accountability partner and the other thing you can do with that accountability partner of course is celebrate your achievements you know when you need someone to kind of bounce off and say hey i did it guess what i did however small that is um so that's h and a and then uh h a b b is blow your trumpet so this builds on that celebration because i don't know what whether you find this as well but people don't celebrate the things that they do, we don't celebrate our micro wins, but actually everything is worthy of celebration. You know, even if you're on your own, a simple, yeah, I did it. You know, I drank that glass of water today because actually drinking two liters of water is one of those habits that I want to create. And the fact that I had one glass to start my day, amazing, I did it. But we have to celebrate that. You have to have that punch the air moment and just pause. You know, we talked about pause, didn't you? And just pause to soak in the fact that actually you've done what you set out to do just in that moment and actually when it comes to habits I think there are actually three celebration points that you get from just one habit you get to celebrate because you remembered it you get to celebrate because you did it and you get to celebrate afterwards because actually it's done and I think that's really important is, is you know, blowing your own trumpet, which we always think we shouldn't do. Um, but I don't know if you found that as well, is that you know, people don't spend enough time focusing on the things that they've done rather than focusing on the things that they haven't done. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm always, I will do weekly check-ins with a lot of my clients and, and I will tell them, you know, especially because they might lose two pounds. Now to them, it's, oh, it's only two pounds. Like, That's amazing. Or even if they haven't, it's not weight loss. Let's say it's, you know, they've walked 50,000 steps in total that week. I'm like, that's amazing. You know, that's something you wasn't doing before. And and I will say to people, like, post that. Be account, You know, so that ties into the accountability of A as well. 
cool. in with in with blowing the trumpet so intertwining two of those things there it's like a be accountable let people know you're doing it because then that adds accountability you're not hiding away from it you've put it out there that you are going to do this you know and then b as well is celebrate when you've when you've done something when you've achieved it and most of the time when people do that i think a lot of people are scared to blow the trumpet in case well you know how it is people are always scared of what people think mm. and they're scared that people will have higher expectations of it. So I, I, I imagine in my particular experience with, with working with clients is that they're scared to blow the trumpet because they think that people will think, Oh, well, why are you blowing your trumpet? That's not very good. And I have had those situations. I've had those situations where a client has say gone into work. She's lost five pounds in a month, which is, as we both know, it's great. You know, as long as it's the right way. And then she's had some, a work colleague sort of be like, Oh, is that it? You know? So I think people's perceptions, people are scared of what people's responses are going to be. And that'll put them off blowing the, the, their own trumpet. But actually, so I think you should just do it. You should, even if you celebrate to yourself those small little wins, you don't have to necessarily tell other people if you don't want to. But um, I'd encourage people to just write down the wins. You know, um, so one thing that I was doing in the first lockdown, not so much this one, is I started writing down my wins every evening. So I'd, I'd write down three wins of the day, and the reason why I enjoyed doing that is because no matter what kind of day I had, I'd always find something that was a win that day yeah yeah no I, I i love that and i think definitely you know it's not so much about necessarily having to broadcast your achievements but actually having that kind of sense of self-achievement is even more motivating um, and you can have your own silent punch the air moment and actually physically you know jump up and and punch the air but i think that takes us um really nicely into the uh i for habits work which is about your identity um because actually the other thing that i like to think about is when you have done what you've set out to do what does it tell you about yourself? You know, when you're writing that that win down as you, you're doing, what does it tell you about your character, your personality, your your identity? So the I for identity is is very much about that statement I am, because actually, if you've done something or are intending to do something, I am energetic, for example, is you know really really powerful statement of your identity. And if you can connect your habits with the person that you really believe that you are, you will actually start to change your actions to match your beliefs, to match your identity. Um, and so, what I uh, think is really important is to create that sort of positive affirmation. Yeah. That connects with your habits. So if, for example, you want to create a habit of exercising better, then say out loud to yourself regularly, write it down, put it on post-it notes, I am energetic. If you want a habit of being more tidy, again, regularly say to yourself, I am organized and write those down and keep them visible because I think that's identity statement really, really is probably where habits should start from, resonating with you, the person. Um, so yeah, so that's um, H-A-B-I and then I've got T. So the T for habit is tiny, start tiny. And I think we've talked about this yeah. a bit, haven't we? You know, we've yeah. got to really, really simplify change to micro change, micro habits, and actually start with the easiest thing that you can do. Like it's so easy, you almost feel as though, well, I'm not doing anything. I'm not pushing myself. I'm not stretching myself, but actually you are because it's about those small changes. So as I said, you know, for me, for some reason, drinking water is so difficult. Even right now, I've got on my desk, you know, this- I can't little... find my water bottle. As, <laughs> as we're talking, you mentioned it before and I'm, you, you just said something about before. My, I have a two litre bottle of water so I can do it. And already it's not in my room. I'm terrible for it. Yeah, you know? I know. Exactly. It seems like it should be the easiest things, but I can watch water growing bubbles and I still wouldn't, yeah. wouldn't drink it. But actually to change that habit, just start with one glass every morning. And, yeah. and that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm really getting into this routine of every morning and it's starting to get automated. And when it gets automated, that's that's when you can start to build it. And it's the reason it's becoming automated is because it's tiny. Drinking one glass of water, yeah, I can do that. Get up in the morning, have a glass of water. Easy, done. And then you can start to layer it and layer it. 
um, and then start to become like brushing your teeth when you're not even thinking about it. So absolutely the key is, you know, start tiny. It's that 1% rule. I did a post on uh, social media recently about that is it's really breaking down whatever you want to change into the tiniest 1% change that, uh, that you can make. Um, so that's habit, H-A-B-I-T. Wow. It's already all co connecting together. This is already brilliant stuff. And we haven't even finished the acronym yet. But, <laughs> but before we move on to W, on. regarding habits, because we've just finished the habits word of the acronym, how long do you really think, or, or is it based on the person, how long do you really think realistically it, it can take to really have something become automated and become a habit that you can build upon? You know, there's different suggestions that it's sort of six weeks 12 weeks some people even suggesting a lot longer is it really just dependent on the person or is there a, a realistic time frame that you can expect to work on something so much that it just becomes a habit um yeah that's a really interesting question because there's quite a lot of research that have banded around um about this and the the real answer to that question is it depends on the complexity of the habit itself. Um, and you'll have heard a lot about, you know, 21 days to, to create a habit. Um, and actually where that came from was from a um, plastic surgeon. Um, and uh, what a plastic, this plastic surgeon, I can't remember the, the doctor's name, but what he noticed was that it took 21 days for his patients to get used to the changes that he'd made. So if you were having something done to your face, it took people 21 days to start to understand the chain and start to resonate with change. And that's where this notion of 21 days to create a habit, to create a change came from. Right. Um, but actually in the real world, that doesn't really fit with yeah changing habits and creating lifelong habits. Um, what more research has shown is it's, you know, people like a number and the number that's coming up in averages is 66, which is kind of a much more realistic number yeah. for embedding change. But actually exactly as you said, it could be three months, it could be, you know, it could be a year, it depends on the complexity of what you want to change. But I think, you know, people like to have numbers in their head. I think 21 yeah. is not the number to have in your head. <laughs> Um, but more than that, it's about repetition, isn't it? And it's about persistence um, that's going to create and, and create the number of days for you um, until it become, until life becomes automatic for that particular area for you. So I wouldn't focus too much on change on the number. I would focus a lot more on exactly what you said, enjoying that process, creating that ripple effect and just building and building and building rather than setting this sort of, you know, ill-defined timeline, really. Perfect. All right, so let's go and let's carry on with our acronym. Let's go to W. What we got? We've done S habits. So. Oh, habits. There you go. I'm missing. I'm missing S. So the S is your surroundings, and this is about creating the right environment for success. So, for example, if you want to cut down on sugar. And well, if you've got a cupboard filled with biscuits, that's going to be temptation that you don't need. And actually, we get to change our micro environment. We yeah. might not have any control about what the supermarkets are putting on their shelves at our eye line as we get to the, the checkout. But what we do get to control is, you know, we're all used to that one meter space in front of us now, aren't we? Well, that is your micro environment. You get to shape that. So, you know, put in the triggers to create a habit there as well as remove the triggers for the habits that you that you don't want. Um, so for I'll give you an example. At the moment, I'm trying to um, build what I call what I'm calling five by five. So by 5 a.m. in the morning, I'll have done a five minute uh, walk uh, on the treadmill. And what I've done to help trigger that is I put my trainers right next to the treadmill. And I, they stay there. I come off the treadmill, I put, take them off, put them there. When I get on, they're there. Now that trigger, that's me creating my surroundings to make sure that everything that I need to make five by five happen is there for me. And I have to worry about, you know, where my train is. I'm, oh God, I can't find them today. They're upstairs, I won't bother. I literally have created the right environment. And so I think that's really important. If you want to go for a daily walk, there's no point having your trainers in the back of a cupboard, you know, create those surroundings for success because that's what we need. You need good surroundings for a good habit. And all our behavior is very contextual. We're very, very influenced about 
by what's around us, aren't we? And so really think about what are you surrounding yourself by and who are you surrounding yourself by as well? Because people influence us big time too. Putting something in place to 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 make you do it. So, you know, the same thing I, I tell people to um, to do with their alarm clock, you know, like put put the put their you know, if, if I want people to do a workout early morning because they need to, because, you know, they might work a long time and they know that the evenings are not a good time for them to exercise. They know they want it to be in the morning, but then when it gets in the morning, they obviously change their mind. So I tell people to like literally put their alarm clock over to the other end of the room. They have to get up to then press snooze or turn it off. And then there's a couple of dumbbells right next door, <laughs> not, right next door to the alarm clock. And by time... Yeah, people don't want to wake up, but by the time they get out of bed to go and hit the button, the dumbbells are there as a reminder of let's go. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So we're on W now. Indeed, we are. We got out right this time. <laughs> yeah. About <laughs> that habits work. Yeah. Habits work. W. The W is for why. So know your why. And again, we've touched on this a little bit, but if you're trying to reach that new goal, you've got to be really crystal on. Why on earth do you want to do this? And it's it's not really good enough, is it, just to say, I want to lose weight or I want to exercise every day or I want to be more organized. You've got to ask yourself why and keep asking yourself why to really, really, really get to the core because ultimately it is your why that's going to be your driver and your motivator. It's that little why that's sitting on your shoulder that keeps you going. So um, let's play this out. So. I want to exercise every day. Why? Because it's good for me. Why is it good for me? Because I notice that my mood is given a really good boost after I exercise. So why do you want to give your mood a great boost? Well, it's because then I feel more energized and love to play with my children more. Why do you want to play with your children more? Well, I want to be a role model for my children. I want them to know I love spending time with them and having fun. And bang, there you've got it. That's why you want to lose weight, because I want to be a role model for my children. And that's what's going to keep you on track rather than the simple, I want to exercise more or I want to lose weight. So it's really, really getting to that that core. Um, so definitely know your why before you embark on, on any change. How, when do you stop the whys, though? Because it was like, yeah. eventually, it's like, <laughs> why, 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 why? But I do the same thing. You know, I mentioned before that I do the three wins at the end of the evening. Mm. But then I was also doing it in, in a habit, but I fell out of it, of, of writing, um, because I I was I was um, on a programme of a life coach, and he told me to do this, um, Paul Moore. And one of the um, things we were doing in the morning, so he did the three wins in the evening, but the morning was today I plan to do this and there was the why because it's all good just saying I plan to do this or or it was even writing down your feelings it was today I plan to feel this way because you are in control of your emotions your feelings but then it was like why mm-hmm. um, and then the how so I think it's very interesting you say and then the same applies to fitness people know what they want to achieve most people know what their goal is mm-hmm. um, which is great there's a start but then they don't really talk about why or, or even how. How how can sometimes be okay? Because I suppose if you're if you're entrusting yourself with a coach, it's the coach's job to know how is the best way to do it. But you must know the what and the why. Because and and I feel bad sometimes. I don't really like selling my services on pain points. Mm. I'd much rather promote a positive environment. However, the sad reality is sometimes people need to know like you say, the reason why before they're prepared to make an investment in their selves and their, and their health is if you just made it full of roses, like, yeah, you know, I offer a, um, a six week weight loss program. Cool. Mm. What, why should I, why, you know, why, why do I want, why do I need that? So sometimes it's quite, it's, it's quite hard for me because I'll have to pull out the why from people. It's like, you know, especially what's going on in the work, world, reminding people of, do you need to, to change your habits because of this and and it, sometimes i don't like doing it because it can promote a bit of a negative feeling but sometimes you need that that to really dig into bring the why to the surface to make you go right 
okay, this is how I get to the what and the how. But even if you change your own mindset around that, Callum, is actually you by you talking about why with your clients is actually so empowering and so motivating, giving your clients space to have this sort of conversation that they have never had before. You know, we don't give ourselves enough headspace to get into the core of ourselves. And here you are presenting an opportunity to do that. And how important is that? You know, because we have all born with a sense of identity. We all love to preserve our identity. And therefore all you're doing is taking people back to that place and creating an internal driver and allowing that, you know, phoenix to arise from the flames as such. So I think what you're doing is, is fantastic. And, you know, those are incredibly important conversations. Um, I like to talk about those as sort of, you know, passion and purpose and life's purpose. And so that's my first element for my lifestyle first method is really talking about purpose and it is incredibly transformative. So I think you're doing a fantastic thing, actually going out of your comfort zone to help someone back to that, you know, comfortable and uncomfortable yeah. part we were, we were talking about um, and doing that. But actually, I think it's a really good thing that you're doing in terms of what you're actually being able to create from just that conversation oh well thank you now i don't feel as bad <laughs> <laughs> brilliant um, amazing so um oh. where are we oh we're on oh yeah. four obstacles because we've got to expect them there's going to be roadblocks there's going to be obstacles life's not meant to be a straight line we're meant to go off course aren't we but Absolutely. It's anticipating the roadblocks. It's anticipating the obstacles so that you can plan for them and know how to circumvent them. So otherwise we keep raising barriers and we don't achieve those habits that we want because of the blocks and the barriers that, are, that we create. Um, but we've got to think about how do we overcome these obstacles? So it's a bit of planning. If you want to go for a run every day, what are you going to do on a rainy day? day how are you going to continue your habit are you going to be able to run around the furniture in your house are you instead going to go up and down the stairs what is your alternative resolution and I think if that's the air I think it's really important to think about obstacles appreciate them and accept them they're going to happen but plan for them have I think day. especially now especially right now um, you know I have a lot of people who you know love going to the gym whether we think that gym should be, you know, included, class is essential or not, is is not the debate to bring up. However, um, a lot of people now, you you could say that the obstacle is a lockdown that not everyone could envision happening uh, the first time round, and then even on the second time round, it kind of just happened so quick that it may have thrown people off course a bit. So people have been forced to now have to find an alternative to go into the gym, which they get so many different benefits from, depending on the person. Um, so what do you do if the obstacle is just not predictable at all? Again, it's back to choice. You know, we all, we all have a choice. Okay. So the gyms have closed down. What else can I do? You know what? I'm going to think back to when I was a kid, what I loved doing was hula hooping. That is difficult. <laughs> that is very yeah. difficult. But you know what? It is. It's, it's, it's creating some thinking time to think about what else. You know, so me, for example, I'm just looking around. I've got a pair of dumbbells down by my desk. And again, they're in my surroundings as a reminder. Uh, the fact that, you know, I can't get to the gym and use 50 different weights. Well, do you know what? I can still have a set by my desk. And in between conversations, I can actually utilize them. So it's again, thinking about back to, you know, what can I do? What is it that I'm going to be able to create from this situation? Yeah, I've it much preferred kind of the group classes, but that doesn't mean it's all or nothing. Um, so we're now on to R. And the R is very simply the three R's, reminder, routine, reward. Make sure your habits follow this. Don't just change your actions. Create that reminder, have that routine, celebrate the reward. Because until you do that, you're not creating habits at all. You think you're creating habits, but actually all you're doing is creating actions. Yeah. And if you want to embed those back to how we brush our teeth, you've got to have the three R's um, in place. And now we're nearly at the end. Habits work. <laughs> the K is keep at it. Love so that. be consistent because the definition of a habit is something that you do regularly. And actually, if you think about it, doing something every day is easier than doing something 
sometimes. So, you know, if you want to eat more vegetables, eat more vegetables every day, not maybe just once a week. Um, but remember that first principle, which was focusing on keeping things tiny. So be consistent. Don't think about those outcomes. Um, and that's the important thing about sort of keeping at it. It will some habits will feel hard in the beginning, you know, and then you'll suddenly reach this pinch point, a bit like sort of, you know, clutch. I mean, I can't clutch points. I can't drive a manual car, but there is this point at which everything just knits together and then it will suddenly become easier. Um, from that moment and I think you know charting your progress like you said is really really important you know because actually you've got that motivating reminder whether you're ticking off days on a calendar or creating this little tick sheet you know having that reminder to just keep at it is really really useful um, so that's habits work fantastic that was good <laughs> I was I, 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 that was as good as I knew it was going to be when I first read about it um because i just think that yeah i think right now this is the time use use these lockdowns use this strange time in the world to start implementing this stuff now so that when the world does open back up and it will you know they're, they're there that you know use this time i think too many people very and, and it's understandable you know mental health is quite bad for people at the moment and, and that, that then drips into physical health as well but i think all this stuff you just spoke about it is easy stuff very effective very powerful but anybody can do it and i think the time to be starting to do stuff is now yeah yeah no i i'm, I'm completely with you and it's also once you've built habits they become your non-negotiables and so you carry them with you in every environment that you that you go to you know someone if I said to you hey Callum you know what from tomorrow don't brush your teeth every morning it's like no I'm not going to stop doing that because yeah. that's the way I roll and that's the thing with habits once they work for you they become your non-negotiables whether however busy your day gets the fact is you're still going to be going and doing that five minute walk or that 10 minute run or whatever it is whatever environment you're you're at and you'll change and adapt to your environment to ensure that that happens because it's a non-negotiable um and that's the lovely thing about habits and that's why they are the absolute bedrock of change love it fantastic stuff well i've i've thoroughly enjoyed listening to all of that um that was yeah that was amazing so if people to look for you now where can they find you where, where can they find you know a bit more about your work um and and yeah just get to know a little bit more if they're interested yeah absolutely so there's um, always my website which is www.dralkapatel.com um, and you can easily kind of book in a conversation with me through that or, or drop me a message and there's lots of info um, on there. Uh, like you, I'm on all the sort of social media channels and that's um, at Dr. Alka Patel UK. So you can, you're very welcome to drop me a line, drop me a message um, through there. Um, and actually the um, one exciting thing that I'm doing uh, that I must tell uh, you and your, and your listeners is um, I'm actually launching um, a little uh, video series over the 12 days of Christmas so it's called the 12 days of Christmas and through that uh, I'll be letting people know a lot more about the lifestyle first method and providing some real actions just to impregnate little changes into your day to actually take you on that path of healthier happier living so um, that'll be launching on the uh, on the 1st of December so if people want to get to know me a bit more um, and what I love to talk about and, and how uh, how I work uh, then sign up to to that video series um the 12 days of christmas for that winter winning mindset um and let's get to know each other amazing okay well i'm going to drop um i'm going to drop that link and stuff into the description of this episode so people can go and check you out if not search for dr Al patel on social media and yeah go and give her a follow get ready definitely jump on that uh, video series that sounds awesome especially you know especially with what's going on and we don't really know where where we fall around christmas for a, for a lot of my well, for the, the uk is split but i know if people are listening in england it's a little bit different um, we don't really know where we stand um, in december this might be a perfect time to jump on something like this absolutely and i think i just also want to say you know, 
big applaud to you as well, Callum, for uh, getting this podcast going. I think it's an incredible thing that you're that you're doing, putting out, you know, really important, vibrant messages as, as well. Um, and just for yourself as well. You know, it's something that you've just said, I'm doing this and here you are doing it. So, uh, you know, living out your passion. So really I do. I got comfortable with being uncomfortable. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you very much. And yeah, it's been fantastic to have you uh, on the show. And uh, yeah, I, I hope I hope to have you on again soon. Hopefully, hopefully when I'm on episode 152 <laughs> or something like that, or, or 66, that important number, that'll be important uh, number. Yeah, <laughs> it will be back. No, it's been really lovely talking to you today, Callum. Thank you so much for. Thank you very much for coming on, and yeah, take care.